All right, now the FAA has a ton of regulations and numbers they want you to know for the test. Now, a lot of these you're gonna see come up again and again on the test, and some of them are probably just going to be posed as different questions, but you wanna make sure and fully read the question and look at those answers. Now, the numbers that we're gonna run through now, no need to write them down. We have a downloadable PDF that you can download and study to your heart's content, but we want you to know these numbers because you are going to see them on the test. The number one, that is the number of aircraft that you're allowed to fly in the air at any one time. Now, this doesn't mean that if you have a UAS company and you have five drones and you've got guys in different locations, you can't fly them at the same time. It only means that one operator can only operate one drone at a time at any one location. Now, this is one of those uh, regulations that, that you can get a waiver for. If you saw the last Super Bowl, you saw that Intel recently flew hundreds of drones and they actually had a special waiver for that. But the number you need to know is that you're allowed to operate one drone at any one time. 400 feet AGL or above ground level. This is the maximum altitude that you can fly your UAS above the ground. Now, if you are doing some type of an inspection or photography of a building, you can be 400 feet above the top of the structure as long as you are within 400 feet radius of the object that you're filming. So 400 feet above ground level or 400 feet above the object that you're photographing as long as you're within a 400 foot radius. 0.55 pounds, that's the minimum weight that your drone uh, will be to be registered with the FAA. Now, if you have a small plastic drone that you only fly inside and it's less than 0.55 pounds, you do not need to register that. But anything over 0.55 pounds up to but less than 55 pounds needs to be registered on the FAA's website. And that website address, we'll put a link in the video, but it is www.registermyuas.com faa.gov it's the only website you should be going to there are some other ones on the internet that are charging a lot more than five dollars and you don't need to go to those those are actually scammer websites make sure you're going to the faa.gov site to to register your aircraft 13 years old is the minimum age requirement for registering your drone now that doesn't mean that if you're 12 years old you can't fly a drone it just means you need to get a parent to register your drone so if you are 13 years or older, you are allowed to register your aircraft on the website. Now that you may see some questions on that on the test, and we'll have some examples later in the video. 16 years old, this is the minimum age you have to be to take the FAA Part 107 exam. This is a typical requirement with most FAA exams, and not only do you need to be 16, but you need to be able to read and write the English language which is the universal language of aviation. If you've flown anywhere around the world or if you've listened to ATC or air traffic control, English is actually the language that is spoken around the world when you're talking aviation. Once you pass your test, your test is good for 24 calendar months. That means two years. Now we don't know exactly what it's gonna to require to renew that. Maybe it's gonna be just an online quiz. Maybe you'll have to take a whole another test. We're not sure, but $150 to take the test. Once you pass it with a 70% or better, it is good for 24 calendar months. So remember the number 24. 30 days. 30 days is the maximum number of days you can wait without telling the FAA you have changed your address. So if you move and you have a 107 certificate, you need to make sure and notify the FAA within 30 days. Otherwise, you're not following the FAA regulations. Now, one thing you're gonna notice with the FAA is whenever they want you to do something, it's a very short amount of time. Whenever you want them to do something, they want the maximum amount of time. So you can kind of use that little tip if you're ever looking for how long do you need to uh, apply for a waiver? Well, they want 90 days notice. But if they want you to do something, it's usually 30 days or 10 days or even less. So, but know that uh, for change of address, you need to notify the FAA within 30 days. 90 days for a waiver. Uh, we're going through a lot of regulations here that have to do with age and altitude and drones and this and that. There are some things when we get to the, to the sections of the uh, waivers that uh, you, regulations that you can have actually waivered, we will go over those. 
but you need to give yourself 90 days to allow the FAA to process those waivers. So if you have a job in a certain airspace and you need to do that next week, it's probably not going to happen, at least not under the current environment at the FAA. So they require you to pre-plan out 90 days at the current uh, time to get your waiver. So know that 90 days is the minimum you need to allow the FAA to grant your waiver. 10 days. This is the amount of time you have to report an accident with your UAS. Now, a UAS accident is defined as anything that does over $500 of property damage. So not including your UAS. So if I'm flying a Phantom 4 and I crash into a BMW and break and scratch the, the hood and break the window, that's probably over $500 worth of damage. I'm going to need to write a letter to the FAA describing the accident. You also need to do this if there's any bodily injury. So if you uh, severely injure somebody where they have to go to the hospital, you knock them out and you hit them in the head, those have to also be reported to the FAA. Now again, does not include your drone. If you fly your drone into a building and break a big pane glass window, uh, and it's uh, you know $600 with the damage, you need to report that. If it's $400 with the damage and your drone's $1,300, you don't have to report that because the damage to the property was not over $500. Let's talk a little bit about alcohol and flying. Now, this is something that the FAA obviously does not want you to do, just like when you're operating any kind of a motor vehicle. In this case, we're operating UAS. Now, in the aviation world, we used to always hear the term eight hours bottle to throttle, and that meant if you go out and drink, you have to wait at least eight hours before you can get in that airplane and fly. It's the same thing with UAS. So if you've had any kind of alcohol in your system, uh, you go to a barbecue and you want to go out and work five hours later, you are not going to be legal and you need to wait at least eight hours. Now, another test question that has recently come up on a more recent test was, how long does it take for a drink to leave your system? Well, you may want to say eight hours, it's actually three hours on the exam. So two numbers to remember here are eight hours between your last drink and when you fly, and how long does it take for a drink to leave your system? That's three hours on the FAA exam. Now, your blood alcohol content, if you were to do a breathalyzer, cannot be higher than 0.04 blood alcohol. Now that's gonna be a little bit different than if you're used to a motor vehicle, which is typically 0.08 or something in that range. So 0.04 is the maximum blood alcohol level that you can have and still fly your UAS. So guys, don't drink and fly or don't drink and drone and you'll be fine. 100 miles an hour or 87 knots is the maximum speed that your UAS can fly. Now, if you're looking at a quad cup, you're probably like, my, my drone will never go that fast. Well, some people are using fixed wing aircraft and there are aircraft that are extremely capable of flying past that speed. So you need to make sure that whatever aircraft you are flying for commercial purposes is limited to 100 miles an hour or 87 knots. Three statute miles. This is the minimum amount of visibility you need to have to operate your UAS commercially. Now you might say, wow, three statute miles, that's a long ways away. I know from other regulations that I cannot fly beyond my line of sight, meaning that I have to keep the aircraft in my sight without the aid of binoculars or a telescope. So why would I need three miles of visibility? Well, what it really is for is so that you can see other aircraft, manned aircraft, that could be coming into your area of operations. So when you wake up in the morning and they're like, it's, we have fog and it's one mile visibility, that's not a day to fly. You have to have at least three miles of visibility. 500 feet below clouds. You must remain 500 feet below the lowest layer of clouds to operate your drone commercially and legally. Now, if you go out to the airport and you have a 700 foot layer, can you operate 500 foot below that? Well, sure you can. You take five away from seven, you have 200. Now you know that you can only go to 200 feet because you have to remain 500 feet below that cloud layer. So that's one thing you're gonna to need to know about weather is that, yes, I can fly 400 feet AGL, but I also have to remain 500 feet below the cloud layer. So if you have a low ceiling, you're not gonna be able to probably fly that 400 feet. So 400 feet, maximum AGL is your altitude on your drone, but you must remain 500 feet below the clouds. 
Along with 500 feet below the clouds, you must also remain 2,000 feet horizontal from a cloud. Now, a lot of people say, well, I don't know how you'd measure that, but basically, you need to stay 2,000 feet horizontally away from a cloud. Uh, if you have clouds in the vicinity, you probably should know which direction they're heading because they could eventually come into where you're working. But just know that for the test, 500 feet below a cloud, three statute miles, visibility, 2,000 feet away from a cloud. 30 minutes before sunrise to 30 minutes after sunset. That's the definition of civil twilight and that is the definition of when you can actually fly your drone before it becomes a night operation, which does require a night waiver. So you're out there shooting at what we call the golden hour, which is that hour before and after sunset uh, when you have the nice sun. If you're out there and the sun sets, you can fly for one half hour after sunset before it becomes dark and you must obtain a night waiver. So you need to know that, that if you, if you see a question on the test that asks you, you know, when can I fly or when must I land or, or sunsets at 7 p.m., what time do I have to be on the, on the ground with my UAS, it's going to be a half hour after sunset or a half hour before sunrise. One last one they throw out there, uh, and this is important for the inspection guys, uh, and, and no pun intended, is you must remain 2,000 feet horizontal from guy wires, and that's G-U-Y, guy wires. This is something you'd see on a large radio tower, maybe even a cell tower, uh, the, the lines that go down at an angle. Uh, those can be extremely hard to see, and the FAA requires that you remain, again, 2,000 feet horizontal from guy wires. So guys, if you have any questions, you wanna study those numbers, look at them, print out the printout that we give you in a PDF, you can download it and print it, Study those before your exam. Many of those numbers you're going to see over and over in different variations throughout the tests.